Hi folks and welcome to Truck King. The idea of off-road and adventure vehicles have never been more popular than they are right now. In the world of pickup trucks, we have more off-road trims and options than ever before. So if this is what you're into, it's a great time to go buy a new vehicle. But these things are not just about going through the mud and hitting rocks. That is just a means to an end. Now the end is a truly amazing adventure. It's discovering forgotten and incredible places right in your own backyard. And that's something that we decided to do. So we grabbed a brand new GMC Canyon AT4X and hit the road. Come along on this four part video series that is the GMC Canyon Ghost Town Tour. In the first video in the series, we visited Burwash, Ontario, where there's an old abandoned prison. On the second day of our adventure and in the next video, we went up to a massive open pit mine and we talked about the town of Selwood, Ontario that used to exist to support the mine, but has now disappeared. On the next day, Dad actually researched a place. He found it and said, you know what? I want to check this out. So we went looking for the Falcon Bridge Radar Station, which is just outside of Sudbury, Ontario. And that's the reason why it's here, because of its proximity to the city. Sudbury, Ontario was the home base for the Ghost Town Tour. The town is famous for mining and of course it's iconic Big Nickel, but did you also know that Sudbury is the hometown of late Jeopardy host Alex Trebek? Sudbury was also immortalized in a song by Stompin' Tom Connors, one of Canada's great musicians. And then in more modern pop culture, Sudbury also serves as the filming location for the popular TV show Letterkenny and its spin-off Shorzy. So on day three of the Ghost Town Tour, we set off once again from Sudbury in search of the radar station, and I will let Dad take it from here. Today we went looking for the Falcon Bridge Radar Station. At its height, this particular facility had an entire community built around it. Over a hundred houses, church, school, library, infirmary, gymnasium because there was a lot of people living there and working there because this is a place that was running 24-7, 365 days a year, looking for those Russian bombers. Once we found the site, we discovered that most of the buildings are gone, but a lot of them actually still exist. They've been repurposed into small businesses and even some rental housing. However, this sort of jumble of buildings hid the actual entrance to the radar site, which is situated several hundred feet in elevation above the little community. So we drove around until we finally spotted a gate, which had been overgrown with trees. But in this particular instance, we noticed that half the gate was open. Thinking that it was always like that, we managed to squeeze our way in and head up the road going around down trees and trying to stay on the main trail. We got to the top only to discover that there was a caretaker who was doing his rounds. His first question to us is, what the hell are you doing up here? Apparently that gate down below is normally locked because today this is private property. After we told him what we were into, he actually thought that was kind of cool and was okay with us filming. So talk about getting lucky being in the right place at the right time. All right, so here we are at Falcon Bridge Early Warning Radar Site. So not much left of it, but you can see why they set this up. If you can see in the background, we are at the highest point uh, for many, many, many miles around. So there used to be a radar installation here. It was set up in the early 50s. And so of course the question is why? Well, this was just one of over 50 radar sites strung across Canada known as the Pine Tree Line. Well, this was a collaboration between the Americans and Canadians because of course the Soviets now had the bomb and if it was coming it was coming over the pole this is before intercontinental ballistic missiles so they were coming with the big engine bombers and they were going to come over so the idea was the pine tree line we're all sitting out here watching the skies and if the radar went off and those guys were coming in well that would give 
the Canadians and the Americans a chance to scramble their fighters and hopefully shoot them down. Now, of course, in retrospect, I'm thinking about this, yeah, they'd have shot them down, but they'd all landed here in Canada, even though they were headed for the States. Oh well, luckily it never happened. This facility was here and running for over 30 years. And now, well, frankly, there's not much left of it. But it's still cool to come up here and have a look at the bits and pieces, the foundations. This today also is private property. So you can't get up here without permission. Just a word to the wise. So we're gonna go off and wander around. The one building that remains on site is the command and control building. Large, concrete, and now fully graffitied. It stands where everything else has been torn down. The one thing you notice up top of this mountain is at least an acre of pavement. That's how you know it's a government site, because rather than gravel, they spent their money on pavement. Off at the edges of the pavement, you can see the footings for the radar domes, as well as a track system, which quite honestly ran for several hundred yards and we couldn't quite figure out what it was for. Maybe it actually moved something, perhaps it was shielding heavy cables, but even so, that just leads to more interest in terms of, yeah, what's this thing all about? But probably the weirdest thing that we found, or didn't find, is a huge underground bunker. Underground meaning it's all under grass, but you could see the way that the earth was domed, that there was something down there. We checked it out, and what we did find at the one end was a hatch, a steel hatch with a massive padlock on it, both of which actually appeared to be in decent condition. I can't imagine what's down in that bunker, but I can tell you that it is not forgotten because it's still in good enough shape. Somebody is going down there sometime to do something. Falcon Bridge is actually famous for one other incident over and above tedious years of looking for Russian bombers. On November the 11th, 1975, radar picked up four objects about 15 miles southwest of the radar site. They observed these objects at around 3 a.m. and found them to be hovering at about 26,000 feet. After some time, they shot up to 45,000 feet, stopped, rotated, sat there, and then finally ascended to 72,000 feet where they disappeared. Of course, the radar station got in touch with the U.S. Air Force, who scrambled a couple of NORAD F-106s out of North Bay. The 106s were later joined by air guard helicopters, but sadly they were never able to make any kind of positive identification. So after an hour of roaming through the ruins of cutting edge 1950s technology, we had a look at the technology that we find in our Canyon AT4X, and Steve's going to show you that right now. Let's take a moment now to go over all the new technology here in our Canyon AT4X because for this generation of truck, they really have focused on adding more tech, but also simplifying the way the tech is used in a way. So first of all, Directly in front of me here is an 11 inch driver info cluster. And this is the first time that the Canyon has had a fully digital info cluster for the driver. Now, unlike on some other vehicles on the market where you can really customize everything on the screen, GMC has simplified it so that there are just six different iterations of the screen. And I'll go through them now. So there's one, two, three, which is the full map view, four, which has some performance metrics and the G meter, five is more of an off-road screen with the steering angle, the pitch and roll and the transfer case and the compass. And then number six, this is what I would call the calm screen or the clean screen. If you don't want any information, 
you can just put it on this screen and have a very simple uh, speedometer readout for you. So yeah, again, the customization here, there is some of it, and I'm gonna show you that, but I think really GM wanted to simplify. They wanted to say, we don't want you to be able to set up everything in every little corner of that screen. We want you to be able to cycle through our six main screens, and then from there, you can find the information you want. Now, the other thing they did too is there are three different styles of screen in here. So here on my steering wheel, I'm holding this button. If you hold it down, you can see you have gauge one, gauge two, and gauge three. So let's just go ahead and go to gauge three. And this will just give you a sense. It, it's all the same information. It just looks a little bit different. So again, GM wants to give you the option of uh, picking the gauges that you think look the best. Although that one's pretty much the same. So yeah, some of them change, some of them don't. So you get all the information, simplified screens, and you get three different styles here in the info cluster. Now over here in the center stack, we now have an 11.3 inch center touchscreen. And I can go through a lot of the features on here because frankly what GM has done is they've taken a lot of the features that used to be on my info cluster and moved them to my center stack. For example, we'll start over here with vehicle status. So the one I wanna point out right off the bat before we'll come back to this screen, is the trip meter. Your trip information is now only on your center screen. It's not over here on my info cluster. However, you can hit the button there, add to driver display. I hit this button and then it actually sends this screen over to my info cluster. So you can customize one piece of information on your info cluster and you can do it with whatever you want. I can go to the engine. If you want the battery voltage, boom, that'll send it over to my display as well, tires and brakes, brake pad life, you can do the same thing. Now the overview page is really interesting. This allows me to look all around the truck and you can see the little pluses. Each one is gonna tell me a piece of information. So there's my battery voltage live readout. There's my engine air filter life. Of course, for the filter life, that's not actually checking the filter. It's just based on time. Oil life, same thing. It's based on the time from your last oil change and the amount of miles that you're putting on the truck. There's your tire pressure. That is a live readout right there. Brake pad life, same thing. That's just gonna be a timer, which tells you, recommends when to change out your brake pads. But what a nice looking screen. The graphics are quite amazing. And that is some really good information on the truck. So let's back out now. And I also wanna show you here on our sort of main screen, you can customize any of these little apps on the side. So if I'd like my climate settings, I click and drag and toss it right there. And now I can quickly access my climate. So you do get also five settings over here on the left that you can customize with uh, the things that you use the most. Now there's a few other things in here I wanna show you. One of the cool modes Air down mode, this truck, when you're airing down the tires, you set where you want the pressures to be, and then it will honk at you when that pressure is achieved. That's a pretty cool mode, and it just shows you how serious they are about off-roading. And then, of course, I'll also show you the off-road screens, because there's three of them. This is Baja mode, where you get the G-meter. Terrain mode, where you get the pitch and the roll and your tire pressure. And then finally, you have the overlanding screen where I love that you get the uh, altimeter over here, which tells you your altitude. That really is handy, plus the compass. Now, of course, we also have quick access to the cameras off that screen, which I like too. And uh, the camera system here is quite good. You have 360 degree cameras. You can look all around the truck. This is underneath the truck. Now, sadly, it did get a bit muddy, but check it out. There is a sprayer. So you can actually spray that camera. It does an okay job. A little windshield wiper would be better, but anyways, that is uh, kind of nice to have the sprayer on your camera. Um, what other features in here are important? Of course, Android Apple or Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Those are uh, you know par for the course these days. You basically need to have those. So yeah, overall, I think what GM has done here is is 
simplified some of the controls there there is some vehicles on the market where yeah you're just there's a control over here one down to the left one thing in the screen they've really tried to take everything and put it all into the infotainment system including the control for your lights there's no more light knob in this truck there's no knob down here for me to turn to control the lights you have to do it off the infotainment screen you can tell me if you think that was a good choice or not. Uh, yeah, yesterday we had a situation where I just wanted to lean in and turn the lights on for a B-roll shot, and I had to lean in, turn on the ignition to the truck, go through the screen, and turn on the lights. You know what? It added an extra step, a bit of complexity. If you own this truck, most of the time you're never going to touch that because you leave it on auto. But uh, yeah, it was an interesting choice by General Motors to get rid of it. And again, in the simplification process, they also probably uh, save some money because there's just less physical features here, like a knob, less wiring for it, and just more has been built into the infotainment system. So, yeah, you've seen it all now. Why don't, let, why don't you let me know what you think of all this new technology? After an hour of trekking over the site, we started heading back down the mountain and it occurred to me that this radar station, which was now gone and used to warn us of bombers coming over the pole, well, we don't need it anymore because unfortunately those nukes are now on the top of intercontinental ballistic missiles. So the threat really hasn't changed, just the method of delivery. So as we got down to the bottom, uh, by the way, thanks Wayne for letting us in. We lock back up. So before I head off, I got to thank GMC Canada and also the city of Sudbury for helping us pay our expenses on this ghost town tour. And past that, please let us know what you think of what we've been up to. So go below, hit like, hit subscribe, and join, become a member of the channel. And yeah, leave us a comment because shortly we'll be looking for another ghost town.